তার ভাই জি জি স্যার জি ভাই আপনি শিশি দা একটু ইন্ট্রোডিউস করে দেন রিভিউ তুমি বললে শুরু করব আমরা স্যার আমি জানাবো কামরুল ভাই বললে তখন আমরা স্টার্ট করব সংক্ষেপে morning, I think. uh today again we are going to have enjoy a case based ecg discussion and today we are going to uh, have some ecgs and discussions from professor shishi professor shishi kumarashak is a very unique person in the sense that he has gone to medicine with a degree in cardiology and internal medicine but by heart at heart he is still a cardiologist and actually he is from silet my hometown i often referred my patients in there that you go to him you will find out both you have any internal medical problem medicine problem or a cardiological problem he is the right person to go to solve the problems today i do hope the wisdom he shows in caring for his patients will be seeing that in his ecg presentation athar bhai would you please say something about shishida thank you dr abdul wahid choudhury and good evening to everybody really i am very much pleased to introduce dr shishir boshak really as dr abdul wahid choudhury told dr shishir boshak is a unique man unique in the sense He is a unique teacher, very academic person, very popular teacher, and is a research-minded person. Really, we love him, and he is loved by all his students. Dr. Shishir Kumar Boshak is unique also in that sense that actually he uh, actually his services in the medicine, but by heart he is a cardiologist. He has got all kinds of the qualities. Really, he is a unique person to me. So, dear participants, uh, we we are just waiting to see. how he presents his cases dr shishir kumar boshak really we are waiting for you dr shishir kumar boshak is the right person thank you very much dr shishir kumar boshak thank you atali sir and uh, professor uh, dr abdul wahid choudhury for the kind words uh, for which uh, actually i do not deserve at all so uh, i am very grateful uh, that i am invited to such an enlightened uh, <clears throat> gathering uh, were very enlightened panelist Uh, in this ecg case based uh, study group so shobai ke ami amar shoshoddha salam jani ami shuru korchi i am sharing my screen so we are starting a case based ecg amra char ta case char ta case dekha bar bolar discussion korar chesta korbo shishida there are students from nepal as well so oh, yes, yes, please so, okay 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 so this is the first case <clears throat> 50 year old women with history of diabetes mellitus and obesity presents with dizziness and back pain she also reports myalgia and anorexia she denies any associated chest pain and is mainly focused on her back pain so 50 year old woman has history of diabetes she is obese presented with back pain dizziness 
and also anorexia. Denied pain, focused on her back pain. This is the problem and is the case scenario. And the, I am uh, actually showing the ECG in the next slide. And the question is, uh, let us see the ECG first. This is the ECG. Let us have a look on the ECG. And these are the questions to be asked, uh, to be answered, actually. What is segment abnormality do you notice? What are the differentials, likely differentials? Would you activate CAT-LAB or consider thrombolysis? How do you plan on treating this patient? Let us study this ECG. We are pro uh, I, I waiting do, rhythm. I do think if, if the uh, students can wa want to uh, engage, they can raise yes. their hand and answer it. Yes. Please raise anybody and answer. try to answer uh, those who are interested. We have an approach to uh, actually read an ECG. We know there are different approaches followed by different uh, ECG readers. Rate, rhythm, axis, intervals, enlargements, and ischemia or infarction, or any other algorithm, any other sequence we can see. Any participants uh, actually raise their hands or is like to comment on this ECG? Here we see the rate uh, is actually uh, regular. Rate. Rhythm is regular. Rate is actually uh, not bradycardia, not tachycardia. Uh, almost 90 per minute. Rhythm is regular. There is ST segment elevation seen in V1, V3, and V4 going upwards. This is seen. So the question is, uh, will you activate the cath lab where it is available or we should plan for thrombolysis in this particular patient? Uh, can you go back to the presentation again? Yes. Whenever, whenever we see uh, the ECG changes that the ST segment change they were showing, will you be concerned if the patient do not have ischemic chest pain? For ACS diagnosis, we need to have a clinical uh, presentation as well as yes. uh, investigational findings. That's so very important. Yes, that is very important. That is very important. So uh, pain is not there. Mainly patient is concentrating on the back pain, but patient has got risk factor for ischemic heart disease, diabetes, and obese, 50 year old lady, probably postmenopausal. So Mm, in diabetes mellitus, patient may not complain pain, maybe mm, engine equivalent or so. That is also, a, uh, uh, I can argue also in this way. And the next step is, we yeah, have done report, uh, okay. and okay. Did the patient have any previous ECG? Uh, only this is the ECG? Or... And, uh, this patient do not have any previous ECG. Uh. That's one of the key findings. Whenever we have some difficulty with interpreting an ECG or uh, having some difficulty in giving decision, we should look for previous ECG. That, yes. that, that may help us. Very us. good point. Very good point. But so um, now we have uh, we do not have any previous ECG. The patient has got risk factor for ischemic heart disease, but do not present uh, has not presented with chest pain. So we have done uh, put in eye uh, according to the protocol. Mm, and several readings are normal. What should do we do next? And is there anything extra in this ECG? Should we look back again? It's to the... better to do an ECG again after half an hour. Yes, uh, that is an important point. Uh, but I uh, stick to the ECG. Uh, is there any uh, thing we missed in this ECG? Achha, what about the QT interval? Because yes. Yes, the QT yes. interval they're saying, I don't think that's correct. Uh, the QT interval we have to notice. So this is the QT interval for the um, participants from the beginning of the Q-wave to the end of the Q-wave. There are some intervals which are very important sometimes to measure uh, in an ECG. So uh, let us see the QT interval 
here we can see the QT travel uh, uh, here, here. Yes. Yeah. V2. QT travel is actually sharp. In this uh, uh, computer generated uh, one, it is very short, 201. Uh, QT interval, corrected QT interval is 246 millisecond. Anyway, QT interval is short. So, a short QT interval in this particular patient. So what are the differential diagnosis, short differential diagnosis to consider in this short QT interval? Hypertensemia, digoxin toxicity, congenital short QT interval syndrome. So as this patient is actually 50 year old, this is very unlikely. The patient is not getting digoxin. Uh, it is unlikely. The patient presented with back pain issue. We actually uh, see, let us review the history again. 50 year old, diabetes, obese, back pain issue is there. But also, there is dizziness, anorexia. Anorexia, yes. So yes, yes. Uh, we can actually go for hypertensemia. We can suspect serum calcium level was fourteen milligrams per kg. So uh, there is the important point in hypertensemia. The shortening of the QT interval is due to shortening of the ST segment. ST segment is shortened. There is no ST segment. Gradually shortening, gradual shortening of the ST segment. With marked hypertensemia, the two appears to take off right from the end of the QRS complex. It appears to take off right from the QRS complex, giving it a pattern of ST segment elevation, so mimicking anteroceptal MI or MI. This is the uh, point for which I have presented this ECG. Beautiful. Thank you. And here is some learning point uh, uh, for this ECG. The uh, ECG finding in hypercalcemia, this is the finding that may appear in hypercalcemia, prolonged PR interval, bradycardia, QRS interval widening, there may be bundle brass block, and ST segment changes that can mimic ACS. So, what is important that we should elicit a good history and look for short QT interval. ST segment elevation is not very really uncommon finding in severe hypercalcemia. This is a, uh, taken from literature. And next, uh, so very easy. We need to consider the differential diagnosis of hypercalcemia. We know that here is some uh, DD, hyperparathyroidism primary or tertiary, not secondary, hypervitaminosis, Edison's disease, malignancy, skeletal meds, multiple myeloma, hazard therapy. And you have to take the history in for the details, and you will know the cause. And the uh, hypercalcemia signs of signs and symptoms typically manifest when this is between 12. 14 milligram per DL, uh, watch for bradycardia and hypotension. So the patient is feeling dizzy. Probably uh, this is due to hypotension. So we need to give IV fluid resuscitation and other supportive care, consider bisphosphonate and all these things we know. So final take home points from this particular uh, case scenario with ECG is that differential diagnosis for short QT interval uh, there is no clear cut mark uh, uh, below which we can call it short QT travel. Some literature says that it is below 400 uh, millisecond. Our uh, landed panelist will also comment on this issue. Uh, hypercalcemia, decoxytoxicity, and congenital short QT travel syndrome, these three should be considered. There may be other causes as well. And in case of hypercalcemia, we should look for, uh, well, while considering hypercalcemia, we should look for short QT uh, interval. And ST segment elevation may be there that mimics ACS, which is not uncommon. And IV fluid hydration is the key treatment in the emergency department. Uh, here I show a short video clip which depicts the changes in hypercalcemia. ST segment are short, this ST segment will be shortened as calcium level increases. Uh, so take off from the end of the QRS complex. So QF changes may mimic ST segment elevation MI and later on there are other changes as well.
So thank you. I mean, uh, I, I want to know comments from the panel of experts regarding this ECG that I have finished. Dr. Shishir. Hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, do we have the ECG after the correction of the calcium level? That is the. Uh, no, I haven't uh, actually. Uh, uh, I, I am not able to show the ECG. Uh, Shishida, uh, what was the final yeah. diagnosis? What was the reason for back pain? Was it uh, some met or some uh, hyperparathyroidism? Uh, it was actually uh, uh, shown, uh, uh, happened to be the uh, 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 skeletal mets, metastasis. Ooh. Back pain was due to skeletal mets. Uh, there was some malignancy detected and it was uh, the extra of the back pain showed the skeletal uh, deposits. It's very, very, very interesting case. Very interesting. Very interesting, yes. So, um, Wadud. <coughs> oh, Hafiz Bhai, welcome. Yeah, so now I just wanted to join uh, because I saw the speaker is Shishir. So, it yeah, is an honor. Thank you. <laughs> so, the, thank uh, the you. one so of the pet question um, is uh, in the board exam is this 59 year old with confusion and the EKG. Yes. And what happens sometimes the the fellows do not see the top line and they don't see the confusion part and they just try to read EKG. And I say that when there is a clue in the top, you need to look for you know, apparently normal looking, always look for intervals. 360 millisecond is the usual cutoff for the QT prolongation, if less than 360. Okay. But uh, it needs to be very careful about this. This patient has very significantly reduced uh, QT interval. So the confusion, back pain, you know, we had one patient last week with, with hypervitaminous D uh, and uh, presented with hypercalcemia and short QT. So these are the important things to, to pay attention to. About the ST elevation, my comment is that um, we have not seen much of an issue with the ST elevation and hypercalcemia, although in the literature, but my a hunch will be that it is usually more pronounced in the presence of pre-existing LVH yes. with hypercalcemia that yes. it makes it like worse. But there are some tricks for that, to how to figure that out. Thank you. Can you share? Do I make sir. a comment? Yes, sir. sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Two things. First of all, I mean, we have been talking about clinical medicine for last few sessions. And the question is, in what context the patient presented and what is the EKG? So, I mean, uh, the, the, the question choices are very, very good because shall I take the patient to the cath lab? But the point is the patient didn't have symptom at all. Um, the one, one just thing about the EKG, if you look at the machine read QT interval, it's actually inaccurate. Please pay attention to that. If you look at lead V2, yes. the QT interval is actually 300, at least 320 milliseconds. Yes. It's longer than what it has been measured, uh, uh, measured by the machine. So that's wrong. But even yes. then, it is short. It's short. Um, yes. So, uh, and, and beautiful, because many years ago, I actually published some papers that once serum calcium goes over 40, you can see all kinds of changes, including T wave inversion. And that's a good thing to remember. But uh, I think it's, it's a good, good ECG. It opens our eyes that look, things are not always acute MI. Things are not always intervention. There may be other things to look for. Because one other thing that if I paid attention to this ECG, otherwise I may not do a calcium level and I will miss a diagnosis. So likewise, elect other electrical abnormalities, sometimes the ECG may prompt us to do an EKG. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, electrolyte level or uh, that particular um, um, electrolyte. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sir, what will be the terminal event in a case of severe hypercalcemia? What will be the ECG changes? The ECG change, uh, boy, she should actually show everything. The ST segment part is actually, it, it is not ST elevation because the T wave comes so close, it looks like ST elevation. But there is T, she should also show T inversion. That can happen. 
And we had cases like over 14, it starts happening. And by the time it reaches 18, it basically, you can see all the T wave changes, almost looks like ischemic changes. Bhai, good to hear. I'm driving to uh, the hospital. Uh, Rafik Bhai is in Las Vegas, actually. We had a good time yesterday with Rafik Bhai, now in Vegas. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'm driving because I have a, a patient, a uh, close friend of uh, ours, uh, mother is sick. Uh, and I did not, I asked Rafik Bhai, are you going to join? And Rafik Bhai said, I don't know. <laughs> and I also did not know. And both, look, both of us are attending this uh, <laughs> session and it's because that shows that we love this session and, yeah. and the relationship of uh, EKG session and is beyond EKG. Yes. So yes. one thing is hypercalcemia, Ravik Bhai. <clears throat> there was yeah. a, a beautiful paper on the, um, in the NEGM about the terminal uh, consequences. I don't know whether this is uh, proven or not, but the, the uh, electrophysiologically, it can give this scenario like uh, uh, delayed after depolarization and it can trigger the biventricular VT um, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and then degenerate into VF. Yes. So any comment on that? Yes, I mean, the calcium current, but it's interesting that, that hypercalcemia will be serum, but when you have overloading in the cellular level, and if you look at um, catecholaminergic, catecholaminergic polymorphic VT, the mechanism actually is the calcium overload um, in, in sites, yeah, absolutely. But we haven't seen actually, I used to uh, look at a lot of cases with hypercalcemia in heart failure. They don't develop that much arrhythmia as with other electrolytes. Yes. Um, it is the intracellular load that can trigger um, the um, uh, arrhythmia event. Thank you. Yeah. Beautiful session. Uh, the next, the next case. Yes, uh, I'm proceeding to the next uh, case. This is the second case. Case I have actually uh, uh, telling it to A, and so similar case I will uh, label it as two B. A 68 year old man with end stage renal disease is seen at his hemodialysis center. He missed his last scheduled hemodialysis session. What does this ECG show? This patient has got also other risk factors. Uh, he is also hypertensive. Um, uh, he is getting antihypertensive drug as well. And what we see in this ECG. Uh, dear participants, you can participate. Anybody can raise hand and, uh, and express your comment regarding this ECG. Vibhu, is anybody raising their hand for chat? Hmm. Why didn't you ask someone to come and talk? Yes, there is actually. Uh, uh, let me start. Uh, there is a P wave before a brick is complex. PR interval uh, it, it is normal in rhythm. Mm, there is actually bradycardia. <clears throat> what Rafixal has told us. Yes. You know, Always look at this as a whole, and I'm yes. a bully, a, a court ah, yeah. Is there something wrong? And yes. uh, whenever I look at this city, the first thing that comes into my vision my is the very is prominent picked PT waves. Yes, that's right. That's the thing. Uh, that's the thing is uh, sometimes we diagnose things in two ways. We uh, collect the signs, symptoms, and everything, like in patients here, all the features, then compile, then reach, reach a diagnosis. And another is pattern recognition. By seeing a cat, we see cat. 
so uh, professor vadu is telling a very nice one so pattern recognition sometimes helps us just in one gaze we can sometimes uh, see the abnormality and that is the key abnormality so here is the tall peak wave uh, we call it sometimes hyper acute hyper acute uh, we actually interpret here so here is peak symmetrical peak narrow based and there is also this is r wave in lead uh, v3 33 millimeter is one of the criteria for lbh patient is also hypertensive as i have mentioned though it's not a full criteria for lbh uh, here is the wave so what could it be we know that in acute coronary syndrome, as patient is hypertensive, and we know uh, that uh, CKD patients are also risk factors for coronary disease, and uh, they die of coronary disease mostly. We know. So, um, could it be acute coronary syndrome, the very hyperacute phase? And we know in hyperacute phase, there may be a ST elevation, is the first earliest sign, is uh, electrocardiographic sign, or the hyperacute T may be the earliest electrocardiographic sign or what else can i interject yes but in case of scs it's a regional phenomena it's not a global phenomena right but here we are seeing this is as a global phenomena from that's a very interesting observation yes any, any 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 difference between acute coronary syndrome uh, patients and uh, other uh, differential differentials? And other thing is the T wave, uh, tall T wave that we see in hyperacute, they are rather broad based. In mm -hmm. case of hyperkalemia, that's narrow based. Oh, fine, very good. And also look at the P waves, because if you have very smallish P waves. That also support hyperkalemia. So let me tell you about the uh, my experience is that often hyperkalemia can be associated with uh, acidosis, and if that is the case, then this narrow base, broad base might not work. Uh, so you need to be very careful about this. And with the profound acidosis and hyperkalemia, then ST segment can mimic also. Uh, STEMI. So uh, too much broad base or narrow base, uh, we'll keep that in mind, but that may not be the uh, differentiating point. So I would rather say that if there is hyperacute T and the clinical context, then think about the differential. And you can in a dialysis patient with this, is hyperkalemia until proven otherwise, that's your working diagnosis. Keep in mind the differential diagnosis. Also in this case, you know, this is interesting because usually hyperkalemia with the acidosis and often with the hypocalcemia, QT is kind of normal, a little longer sometimes. But in this case, QT looks like, I, I don't have the measurement in the lower side. Sometimes in the renal dialysis patient, uh, they have uh, what they call the secondary hyperparathyroidism. So be careful about uh, those findings also. Yes. That's so, very uh, useful observation. Yes. I, I'd, I'd like to make a clinical comment on that. Uh, as for example, when the clinical history comes, patient has renal failure, any fellow, any doctor goes to the room, always they start thinking about whether there's an electrolyte issue on this patient. You start thinking about even going to the, before going to the room. So always look for any hyperkalemic symptoms uh, in our EKG finding. Uh, and another thing <clears throat> I like to point out that our fellows needs to know what's the evolution of EKG changes with hyperkalemia. Uh, because this is the hyperacute phase, peak T waves, then slowly widening, and then wide QRS complex, and then may go to cardiac arrest. So they need to be able to quickly diagnose those patients not having VT or something when they see white complex. And, the, and in fact, the patient has severe hyperkalemia went so far. So the treatment should be initiated very quickly. 
and <clears throat> and they need to know you know initial uh, phase of treatment of that and particularly in, in patient with uh, renal failure normally they tolerate elevated potassium level at significant amount because normally you don't see these changes in chronic uh, dialysis patient they, they they have some tolerance of hyperkalemia but if this if you see those evidence right now as we see on the ccg you have to take quick action on that yes thank you so much so as you proceed i uh, actually make, uh, want to make some comments on this uh, ecg so here we find the waves are tall peak and symmetric especially prominent on v3 to v5 Wave morphology is called this tube morphology is called hyperacute and is seen with systemic hyperkalemia or localized hyperkalemia seen in early stage of an acute MI. Uh, I have gone through some uh, publications where there is said um, this hyperacuity in acute ST elevation MI setting is uh, due to uh, extracellular localized extracellular uh, increase in the calcium uh, in the potassium level. They are actually saying. So that could be the cause of hyperacuity in the setting of acute ST elevation MI, but that will be regional. Uh, Professor Vadu Choudhury has uh, told very rightly that, that they may be regional uh, these in the site of the MI STEMI where it is happening. In contrast, normal tube is asymmetric. We should remark or mention in this uh, regard. This is symmetric, this is asymmetric, so regardless of the amplitude, whatever may be the amplitude, this is asymmetric. The upstroke of the tube is slower while the downstroke of the tube is faster. The two waves that are all peaked and symmetric, that is upstroke and downstroke are equal, are seen with hyperkalemia, which may be systemic or localized as in acute MI. So this is the different causes of tall T. Here we see hyperkalemia. For this theoretical purposes, this is symmetric, narrow-based, pointed, and tenting. Narrow-based, this is pointed, tenting is there. And what, what Professor uh, uh, Wadu Chudri mentioned this is broad based, symmetry, but broad based, not tented, not tented like this one uh, in hyperacute ischemia. In comparison to the normal variant, this is asymmetric. This limb is a slow to rise to a peak and sharp fall, asymmetric, not narrow. So, in, com in comparison, there is comparison between three distinct variety of waves is there. Uh, this is all, and we am, I, uh, can I move to the second one, next one, related next one? But before that, Dr. Shishi Bosha, can mm -hmm. you go to the your hyperkalemic ECG again, please? Yes. Dr. Shishi, although it is actually uh, Professor Abdul Adul Choudhury nicely mentioned that the hyperkalemia is a global problem, and ischemia is a regional problem, but still, the tall peaked T wave is usually evident in the precordial leads, not in the limb leads. Is it true? Yeah. Yes. Uh, they, they have also, uh, relatively, they are more uh, tall, taller in uh, precordial leads. Yes, you are right, sir. Uh, it is also mentioned here that uh, mm, it is especially prominent in lead B3 to B5 in this particular ECG, and it is actually more prominent in the precordial leads. You are right, sir. Uh, Shishida, can mm. I interject? Yes. For the young audience, for the very young, not for uh, the specialists, mm -hmm. uh, when we call a tall T, if the T wave high is more than five millimeter in the limb leads or more than 10 millimeter in the chest leads, we should consider that it's a taller T. That's one thing we should remember. The second is, uh, that's what I was saying, it's a global phenomenon because I, we are seeing tall T in lead three and AVF and also uh, lead two, three AVF, as well as in the anterior leaves. And ST elevated MI should be limited to a one arterial territory, not like this, usually, usually. So that's another thing we should consider. But we should remember that in a CKT patient, on dialysis patient, both SES can occur in presence of hyperkalemia as well. So always the clinical context and the patient's presentation 
chest pain present or not, all these things are very important. Thank you, Chaudhary. Very good comments. Thank you. I'm proceeding to the next related case, case 2B. Six, eight year old women with end stage renal disease with diabetes mellitus, hypertension, develops an infection as a result of cellulitis at a nearly newly placed arteriovenous fistula. She developed cellulitis. Her blood culture are positive for staphylococcal bacteremia and intravenous antibiotics are prescribed. Two days later, her blood urea nitrogen and creatine level increase and she develops anorexia, nausea and ECG is obtained, which follows. So here is a patient, uh, women, 68 year old, in seasonal disease, two risk factors, diabetic and hypertensive, septicemia picture, renal function deteriorates, nausea, anorexia and ECG. This is the ECG. Any comment from the participants? Yes, let's, let us discuss the what is the rhythm actually. Fisher Prasad. Yes, sir. What is the rhythm? We we see no P waves. We see broad QRS complexes, regularly placed broad QRS complexes. There is bradycardia. There is tall, still tall T waves. So, what are the differential we can place for this ECG, Shishu Bhashak? Uh, 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 sir, would you kindly make some differentials for this ECG, sir? Professor Abdul Wazir Choudhury actually, he loves this ECG. That is, uh, he has got a very popular Bangla term. Elano Melano TV. Elano Melano TV. That is very... Uh, the, so this is a classic ECG finding for the severe hyperkalemia. But before yeah. that, for the yeah. ECG practice, for the ECG practice for concerning the ECG, what are the differential? Can it be take, tell it that the idioventricular rhythm? Uh, uh, can, I, can I comment, sir? Jamil, yes, please. Since that, uh, the uh, rhythm is coming from internodal area without any P wave, and uh, the severe, uh, there is also bradycardia. Initial part of the QRS complex is narrow, and later part is widening. Uh, a kind of bundle branch type of uh, feature. Uh, and this usually happens in severe hyperkalemia. And uh, in the bottom strip, it looks like sine wave, near about, but not fully sine wave. Yes. So your diagnosis is hyperkalemia? Most likely. So let us see some uh, findings on this ECG. So here is we here we find regular white QRS, very wide, 0.28 yeah. complex rhythm at a rate of 48 per minute, 48 bits per minute. So there is bradycardia, white QRS complex. No evidence of atrial activity and PIP are symmetric. These are the summary findings here. Uh, QRS complex is actually very broad. So this is hyperkalemia, <clears throat> uh, more marked than the previous one, I, previous case scenario, what I actually mentioned in the previous case scenario. In this one, the calcium level is uh, probably is very high. So let us uh, see, uh, mention some learning points here. So hyperkalemia can cause suppression of impulse generation and conduction, resulting in bradycardia and conduction blocks, and ultimately resulting in cardiac arrest in diastole. And uh, we actually uh, review some ECG findings in the setting of hyperkalemia. Serum potassium level may not correlate closely with ECG changes. Not always. 
at all peak wave, which I mentioned in the first case scenario, that is on the hyperkalemia, repolarization abnormality is the earliest changes in the ECG, peak wave. So hyperkalemia is an emergency sometimes, and this should alarm the ECG reader or physician to detect and to take the advantage of correcting it. ECG changes with potassium level more than six is P wave widens, reduction in amplitude. Professor Wadu Chaudhary said the reduction in P wave amplitude is the also a point to be marked along with the tall peak P wave, and P wave later disappears, peer segment lengthens. When potassium level is raised further, more than seven millimole or so, QRS complex further widens, bizarre morphology, what uh, Professor Vazu Chaudhary said, alarm alarm morphology is good, bizarre morphology, sinus bradycardia, bundle pass block, high grade AV block, and later sine wave appearance. And ECG more than nine, cardiac arrest occurs due to asystole, BF, pulseless electrical activity. So although this, this uh, uh, actually changes do not correspond to the level of uh, potassium level always, but this is a guide uh, uh, how we can interpret ECG with increasing levels of potassium. And what is very important that this is the earliest change in ECG and we should recognize it uh, uh, and uh, we should correct it at this phase. And here is a short video clip uh, to show the ECG changes. ECG may be sort of as a string and this changes with increasing potassium level. And we see here, normal ECG, tall peak T wave, broad QRS complex and P wave flattens, and QRS complex widens, progressing to the sinus wave, and then cardiac arrest. So any uh, comments okay. regarding okay. this? Can you back to the ECG, please, again, Dr. Shishish? Dr. Abdul Chudhuri. Yes. As a, as a, during the management of this patient in the, actually in the uh, ICU or CCU setting in this patient, it takes time to correct the potassium level. Does this patient need the TPM support, temporary pacemaker? No, most, mostly no. Because... Uh, just nebulize the patient, give a, a, a calcium gluconate and uh, glucose infusion, insulin glucose infusion. You will find out the uh, very rapid changes in the ECG because the rate is quite stable. So you can wait. Yes, very good comment. Uh, so, uh, Rafik sir, is, uh, are you here? Aziz bhai? Aziz bhai, are you here? Uh, okay. I think network is very problematic today. Mm -hmm. oh. Professor Tofik is here, I see. Yes. But it's a very good example of what potassium uh, can do initial mm -hmm. stage and then later stage. Yeah, nice demonstration from the nice uh, two A and two B ECG. Thank you, <laughs> Dr. Shishi Prashad, for your excellent demonstration. Yeah. Two A Thank and two B ECG. Can I go to the last case? Yes. Yeah. Please. Okay. Okay. I'm going to the last one. This is case three. Let us observe this ECG first. I am give, uh, uh, giving the history just in, within a few seconds. Here we see sinus tachycardia, QA before every QRS complex. There is QA inversion in V1, V2, V3, V4. Flattened is here. And also QA in inferior leads, especially in C and AVF. History is 37 year old obese woman presented with recent onset of shortness of breath. She denies chest pain, cough, fever, is normotensive, non diabetic. Her previous ECG, done just uh, one week back, was normal. Absolutely normal, meaning there was no T wave inversion in these leads. 
this is the history. Now, what is the interpretation of this ECG? Is there any differentials or we could guess any diagnosis from this ECG? Acute inferior MI, Shishir Bashak. Acute inferior MI, uh, sir, here the, uh, this Q, uh, what is, is mentioned is Q, this Q was consistent before, only this is new. And here is very narrow, uh, Q, no pathological Q. But the ST segment in lead three and AVF, do you think normal ST segment in lead three and AVF? Uh, actually, uh, ST segment is not elevated. It, it's isoelectric. There is yes, inversion and there is Q wave, yes. Here is uh, in AVF. Uh, we know that the isolated, uh, if there is Q wave inversion in lead, maybe normal lead V1, AVR, but constellation of all this finding. Uh, what about this V1, V2, V3, and V4? Yes. And patient's history is uh, obese, 37 year old lady with shortness of breath, no chest pain, cough or fever, non diabetic, normal tensive, previous CCG normal. How much obese? Morbid obese? No, just uh, uh, not, just uh, crossed the uh, uh, level of overweight. Has she, has she any long journey or anything like that? Uh, it is not revealed. There is heart history. Patient is febrile. Respiratory rate is 24. Blood pressure is 120 over 75. Saturation is 92. Breathing on the room air. And test examination or other examination is unremarkable. So patient is tachypneic and hypoxic. Hmm. That's important. Q3, so, Q3 is there, but no S1. Uh, that is very important key point. I, will, I am discussing in this uh, following slides that what are the ECG findings in uh, acute pulmonary embolism? This is one a study by this uh, author. Uh, his result is was so inversion is a commonest abnormality. Flattening is in present in nine, 30 percent patients. Sinus tachycardia is also common. So these three are common findings: QA inversions, QA flattening, sinus tachycardia. Rightward axis, 11 percent uh, is found in 11 percent patients. Is segment changes, either elevation or depression, in 9 percent patients. The classic a pattern which is described in the setting of acute pulmonary embolism, S1, Q3, T3 pattern is only 4% found in this study. And in other study, this is less than 10% in patients. Uh, this is not common. What is important to mention here, this is uncommon. And sinus tachycardia, QF inversions are the common finding. Acute. And this ECG, another ECG, here we see this S1, T3 pattern. This is also called McGinn white sign, relatively specific but insensitive. S1, Q3, T3 pattern. Uh, here we see that uh, there is no inversion in, uh, uh, in anterior septal leads. This is another ECG. Here is sinus tachycardia plus T wave inversion in anterior inferior leads to infer leads T inversion and also S1, Q3, T3 pattern. So more the findings of um, acute P is present in a particular ECG, more the likelihood. I'm mentioning it here that we do not do perform ECG for the diagnosis of acute uh, pulmonary embolism, but um, it is said that pulmonary embolism is a great muscular reader, chaddobishi. If it is very, it is very difficult to diagnose pulmonary embolism if it is not suspected properly. So in a breathless patient or chest pain patients, we do ECG and uh, we should not miss any points which uh, is in favor of, which is in favor of acute pulmonary embolism. And we should also 
uh, exclude other differentials from this ECG. That's why I'm actually mentioning it here because acute MI, pericarditis also comes in the differential diagnosis. So further, uh, I'm discussing some points which are learning points. ECG finding in acute pulmonary embolism is generally non-specific and are likely to be caused by RV strain or dilatation. There may be no ECG changes in small, depending upon the uh, amount of acute pulmonary embolism. Actually, we uh, study from the books that uh, pulmonary embolism may be small, that is low risk pulmonary embolism, or there may be submissive pulmonary embolism, as in this case, or there may be messy pulmonary embolism, which presents with severe hemodynamic collapse or syncope. This case could probably be submissive pulmonary embolism. The ECG finding in acute pulmonarism, let us, let us actually review sinus tachycardia, S1 Q3 T3 pattern, rightward axis, new RBB or incomplete RBB, ventricular dysrhythmias, ST elevation or depressions, new type inversion in anteroceptal and or inferior leads, that is the evidence of RV strain in ischemia, it suggests acute pulmonary hypertension and is equal to PE until proven otherwise. We should do other investigations and prove whether it is pulmonary embolism or not. So uh, here are another few points. There are some ECG findings in pulmonary embolism that are associated with hemodynamic instability. We can forecast that this patient, this patient's BP is 120, 70. But there are some ECG features which forecast that this patient may become hemodynamically unstable in uh, following days and uh, increasing the morbidity and mortality. These are two wave inversions in right precordial leads, as in this case, ST elevation or depression, especially ST elevation in AVR. Global ischemia is reflected by ST elevation in AVR, also in V1 and V2, tachycardia in the form of sinus tachycardia or AFib or flutter or signs of right heart strain as evidenced by right axis deviation or tall R in V1. If we find this, any of the features or combination of the features in a patient with submissive P, we should think that this patient may become hemodynamically unstable and may be a candidate of thrombolytic therapy. So the final take-off points from this uh, case scenario is PE may mimic ACS. Make sure to consider P in case of acute onset pain, although this patient has not got pain, and pay close attention to the new, new wave infarctions, ST segment changes or ventricular arrhythmias, arrhythmias. P can also cause low grade fever. Fever was not present in this one, but don't be fooled by just calling it as pneumonia. In case of tachypnea or low oxygen saturation, uh, low grade fever, we may think of pneumonia, but this could be a PE. PE finding, findings are associated with some predictive, hemodynamic, predictive features of hemodynamic instability that I have just mentioned. That may be tachycardia or sinus uh, tachycardia or AFib, and there could be some right heart strains. The features of right heart strain, as evidenced by right axis deviation, tall R in V1, etc. Thank you. So, any comments regarding this uh, scenario, last scenario from the expert panel? Dr. T. Shishir, did you yes, do sir. any other test to confirm the diagnosis in this case, this particular case, that is the, like the X-ray or other test, that is the yes, we, we, like we, this? we should do chest X-ray PA view. Uh, in this particular, uh, 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 chest X-ray PA view was normal. Uh, we should do also troponin I. The patient was breathless. We should uh, perform nt P. And finally, if uh, there is D-dimer, uh, and we should, uh, clinical susceptibility TGP. score is there. Uh, and finally, we should do uh, CT pulmonary embolism, CT pulmonary angiography, CTPA yeah. will confirm the diagnosis. As a, other than the obesity, did, was there any point that you at least to the diagnosis that this patient may have the pulmonary embolism other than the obesity? Was there any predisposing factor in this case? Yes, sir. Uh, Professor Vadu Chaudhary actually mentioned was there any uh, uh, history of immobilization or uh, journey, long journey? Uh, this is not actually present in this particular scenario, and this is missing from the history. And we should ask the patient further. Uh, we are actually we have mentioned very short history that lacks this information. 
I'm interested to know whether long-term use of OCP in such a patient has anything to do with pulmonary embolism. Because uh, OCP use in certain patients can lead to uh, a DVT. Yes. And that can lead to pulmonary embolism. Good, Recently, good. actually, uh, in Bangladesh Specialist Hospital, a surgeon has done a perianal abscess drainage. The next day, mm -hmm. that night uh, around 11 p.m., uh, I was called in. The, the patient was very restless. Situation he needs requires oxygen, around six liter oxygen. They did the ECG, and that ECG shows. S1 QCTT. They did have an X ray that was uh, quite uh, normal. The patient's previous ECG asked for, and it was not there. That was very one rare case of S1 QCTT that I got. Well, I start the uh, uh, heparin immediately, sent the D dimer, and the next day they did have a uh, CTPA, CT pulmonary angiogram. But the patient improved tremendously within 24 hours, within 12 hours, actually. The next morning, the patient is already feeling better. And the most interesting thing is, I just have a look at the patient's uh, lower limb. Her right, uh, sorry, left calf muscle was a little bit swollen compared to the right one. The right left thigh was also similarly. There was the difference of uh, around 1.5 centimeter in the calf muscle, around three centimeter in the uh, thigh muscles. Actually, uh, we did have the uh, measurement done. I asked the junior doctor, they please do it and, and notify me in the next day. Uh, the CT pulmonary angiogram showed there was evidence of pulmonary ampullas that has been scattered and distributed peripherally. Actually, the starting the uh, heparin very early on has resulted in that the thrombus did not progress and it becomes dissolved and scattered and patient improved. I see the patient uh, only two days ago, he has just followed up, he's called completely normal now, no problem. Echo and everything was normal. And another thing is that in pulmonary embolism, unless it is massive, you do not actually find anything abnormal in the echo. If you get RV, RA dilatation, there's a very helpful thing, but you may not get it. You may see the thrombus in the pulmonary artery or in the RV outflow tract or in the branches if there is massive thrombus. But in smaller, smaller cases, smaller pulmonary embolism that is scattered in the distal vessels, only the CTPA can actually show it. Otherwise, you cannot expect that to see in an echo or anything. Yes. Very good case. And actually, here, what is important is the high degree of suspicion to diagnose acute pulmonary embolism. And early intervention is the key. Very good case. You have described. An observation, actually. Yes. I just went in. Only one of her leg was, uh, one of his leg was showing. And I see that it's like a little bit so leg. I just exposed the other leg, compared the two, and I become convinced that it's the case of uh, pulmonary embolism. The most important thing is the patient did not have any respect so whatsoever. He's mm -hmm. not hyper, he was not hypertensive or diabetic or obese or did not have any other problem, any other health issue. The perianal abscess was the acute case and it was dead only uh, one day ago and he, uh, he had that fever and everything, only four days history, total. But even then, he developed pulmonary embolism. That's very surprising. Thank you, Dr. Shishbarsha, for excellent demonstration of different kinds of issues in pulmonary embolism. Dr. Shishir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Dr. Shaila Nasrin has suggested that she should undergo protein C and protein A analysis. Yes, think... yes, 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 yes. So, uh, uh, anticoagulant uh, deficiencies uh, like antithrombin, protein C, protein S uh, should be done also. Yes. Right. But remember that. If you do not send in early on, then if you start anticoagulation, then you have to stop the anticoagulation later. And after an interval of at least two to four weeks, then you should send this test. Otherwise, it will be, it will be false negative. Yes.
Thank you, Shishida. These are good, good cases. Thank you. So I have actually presented three cases, one uh, on hypercalcemia, two cases on hyperkalemia and pulmonary embolism. Both may mimic uh, acute coronary syndrome patients or acute ischemia patients, ST elevation, STT changes. So uh, what is the message is that actually uh, we should interpret the ECG in the light of the history and we must keep our thinking uh, perspective or differential diagnosis wide open so that we can catch all the uh, possibilities and we can uh, intervene the deadly things uh, very soon and treat start treatment uh, uh, start treating the emergency patients and save lives in, in Dr. Some Gigi, sometimes the sometimes the marginal changes of troponin level again confuse us did you do that troponin in this case what is the troponin level do you know Actually, uh, troponin level may be increased because of the right ventricular stress here. Troponin level may be incre increased and may confuse this picture. Uh, uh, but as this is strain pattern, not an acute MI, the troponin level will uh, serially, uh, serial troponin level will not be just rise and fall of, that follows in acute MI. Uh, this will be minimal elevation and will actually be horizontal curve, uh, plane curve. Probably that will differentiate between an acute MI and the uh, and the troponin level that is raised in the setting of acute PE. Thank you very much. So, any comments from other participants? That is penalties. Jamil, Shofik. Dr. Shishir. Yes, sir. Uh, you can stop your screen sharing. Then you can. Okay. Okay. I was telling before that Shishida will bring his the uh, internist perspective into ECG mm. interpretation. I was very right. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly the first case was a very, very, very important case. First one. And I always tell that you should always uh, have a wider horizon, a wider thinking process. And as Rafik Sar always says, Look for the differentials. What can, what other things can happen? What other things can be responsible for these changes? We should look for that. Dr. Abu Naim, can you hear us, Dr. Abu Naim? Can you unmute? Yes, sir. I said, did you follow the cases presented by Dr. Shishi Boshak today? You are the young participants, Dr. Abu Naim. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Shabgula case, sir. Shunesi, sir. Now, can you correlate whether you have uh, experience of similar cases, as I was saying? If you have any experience of similar cases, they, that just go back in your mind and think whether you have missed something, similar cases. Uh, sir. Emergency have a Erukum case at Dekinisa, Tobe Airport take a sir, Dekle, sir, suspicion as be sir. Suspicion as it is important. It is important. That's the most important thing we are trying to install in you. Thank you. Athar Fai, Dr. Zilur Roman, Zilur, can you hear us? Dr. Zilur, can you unmute yourself? Dr. Zilur. So, sir, thank you, sir. Uh, yes, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Sir, I, I always follow the your group, uh, but I never talk in this group. <laughs> so, sir, before the before uh, today's presentation comments, I like to thank sir you and my uh, other teacher Abdullah Abdul Chaudhary, sir, to create this group and teach us. I, Still, I am learning, sir. I am, I am always learning, sir. You know, uh, about Shishi Boshak. When I, uh, I was the student of Silet Medical College, you know, sir. We know that Shishi Boshak is internist, but very popular, uh, yeah, you know, physician in the Silet town. When I was in the, <coughs> maybe I, uh, first time in uh, Eastern Province, <coughs> sorry, sir. Dada will come to NICVD. 
to for 15 days or uh, one month uh, to see the catholic but today i think uh, what we see it is excellent sir i i to say it is excellent as uh, I, i do not know about him very well but i know he is academic he is good clinician very popular physician in the silet city so i i today i could say he maybe he is now very popular teacher i think in the uh, silet ami josmani medical college thank you yes. sir thank you once again sir yes thank you very much for your comments nice comments thank you dr jilu roman so actually dr shishir bhosak has proved that he is a unique teacher he knows how to present the cases how to no 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 really shishir bhosak your uh, collection presentation and the uh, preparation of the cases serial by serial is unique really i think i must congratulate you and Thank i think you. our participant has learned a lot uh, particularly me myself actually i have learned a lot from your presentation beautiful presentation of the short cute interval really it was a nice case and finally the pericardial equation so professor abdul abdul chudri you can uh, uh, wrap up the session uh actually i always find something interesting in each each and every day in my practice and also in my working place uh you can see a lot of issues and they can tell you a story if you have the mind to read it carefully with respect with affection i would say the issues will embrace you like anything will give you comfort will puzzle you we make you worry and will make you happy when you reach a conclusion and that comes out to be correct it gives you the pleasure of doing something really great a simple ecg a bedside test but immense in its capacity to ignite the thinking process in a particular case it may be very simple but in a particular context the same ecg may be very important this perspective of looking at the ecg enjoying it analyzing it that's what we are trying to do with this ecg study group we want to ignite your uh, i should say sense of enjoyment with ecg let us together play with the cg learn with the cg enjoy the cg thank you everybody and review you and your team thank you again for being with us all this time and the audience as always thank you thank you dr shishi boshak thank you again thank you sir thank you professor vadud choudhury shishi the kuch chamatkar hi is case pila apnar oi je pore je igla disen igla holo je learning point gula topic gula